Peter, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to the class. All right, so as he mentioned, my name's Peter Finchen. I am currently finishing up my PhD in nutritional science at the University of Illinois. Um, I, I actually just got my defense date set yesterday. Um, so I, I'll be defending September 4th, um, so less than two months away, um, I'll finally be done. Um, I actually have a little bit of kind of a different background probably than a lot of you. Um, I actually have a bachelor's degree in biochemistry. Um, when I went to school for my undergrad, um, you know, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. I, I thought maybe pharmacy, physical therapy, changed my major a bunch of times. Realized I was pretty good at chemistry and ended up being a biochem major. Um, but I minored in nutrition and I really um, enjoyed nutrition and I ended up actually doing undergrad research in nutrition um, with one of my professors and I, I must have done a good enough job because following my uh, you know, my bachelor's, she offered me the opportunity to work in her lab for my master's. Um, and this was all at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. Um, but, so I, I did my master's in physiology, but I was doing nutrition research, um, you know, I, it would, and then taking physiology and nutrition courses. Um, and then after that, um, decided to go get my PhD, so I enjoyed doing research, I enjoyed, you know, the nutrition exercise side, side of things, and and uh, actually ended up at the University of Illinois. Um, and I'm in the nutritional science PhD program, I'm almost done now, I, I've been here for five years. Um, and I, I've been working in an exercise physiology lab. Um, so my advisor's in exercise physiology, I'm in the nutrition program, so it's a pretty good mix of exercise and nutrition. Um, my, my dissertation project is on uh, HMB supplementation and dialysis patients looking at muscle loss, uh, physical function, strength. Um, you know, in an ideal world, I would be studying how to get, you know, huge, how to get jacked, how to, how to, you know, build muscle because that that is really my interest. But um, in the research world, you have to ask questions that you can get money to fund if you want to actually be paid and have funding. And so the muscle loss side of things is very heavily funded because it is a big problem. And so um, my, a lot of my PhD research has been on muscle loss dialysis patients. But I have um, done some collaborations um, on a couple bodybuilding related papers. Um, and, and we did a case study on me during my last bodybuilding contest prep, which is and which has been published since. Um, so that's kind of my academic side of things. On the, uh, athletic side of things, um, I am an NGA natural pro bodybuilder. Um, I won the overall DNGA Titan Classic in Des Moines, Iowa in 2012. Uh, I've been competing since 2004, training since 2002. Um, so I started lifting when I was 16. Um, I did my first contest when I was 18 and I'm 29 now. Um, I'll be doing my first pro contest next spring as long as all goes well. Um, so at the age of 30. Um, and um, I, you know, over that time, I guess over the years, you know, of kind of my education and, and working out, training, all of that in the gym myself, people started realizing, you know, I was placing well in contests, I kind of knew what I was doing, I was educated, and so they started asking me for advice. And so I started working with people, you know, friends for free or next to nothing, you know, cheap, free, whatever. And, you know, over the years, I was always working with a few people here and there. And eventually it got to the point where they started referring me to people I didn't know. Um, and for a while I turned those people away. Um, and eventually it got to the point where I was like, all right, we're, you know, my wife and I were like, all right, we're getting enough people referred to us, we're turning away, we don't know, we should get our legal protections in place and let's, let's roll with this. And so we, at that point, we got an LLC, we formed Fit Body Physique LLC. Um, and we started working with more clients and it, it's just kind of grown from there. Um, at this point, uh, once I graduate, this, this is my full-time job. Um, I, I work with clients pretty much exclusively online. Um, we, you know, I, I do go to some client contests. Um, there are a few clients who are local. We might do some posing with in person, but by and large, um, most of what I do is online. 
Uh, I would say that 60, 70 percent of our current clients are competitors or have aspirations to compete in the future. Uh, the other 30 to 40 percent are our general population um, at this point. Um, and so, you know, I I would say at this point, you know, like I said, once I graduate, you know, I'll, I'll continue working with clients. I have opportunities to give talks. Um, I've, I've traveled to several different places around the country, and I got a couple more coming up this summer. Um, to give talks, I, I write articles for different websites, um, and, and that's kind of my career path, my PhD at this point, which is which is actually quite a bit different than the traditional um, academia industry type job that that most people do with with a degree like I I will have here in a couple months. Um, so that's kind of my background, um, but you know usually so I've done this a couple times before with this class. Um, usually, you know, I like to have you guys ask questions and, and kind of make this more interactive. So do you guys have any questions about me, my background, grad school, what I'm doing with clients, bodybuilding, whatever? Um, what is like the biggest trick to assessing someone over the internet and actually being able to know confidently what you're prescribing them is correct? Yeah, so the, the toughest thing with that, it, you know, the, the keys I think are one: you got to learn, you got to know quite a bit about them before you tell them anything. Um, so all the clients I have, when they contact me, I send them a client application form. They, it, it, that includes what they've done during past. It asks questions about what they've done during past preps, what their goals are, what they're doing currently in regards to nutrition training, uh, you know, uh, nutrition training, cardio, uh, you know, all all of that type of thing. Um, and so they, they fill that out, um, and so I get a pretty good idea of what kind of their background is and their goals. And then from there, uh, we have a, a Skype session or a phone call prior to ever starting. Uh, we do, you know, before I write their plan, um, you know, usually they're like 60 to 90 minutes. We talk about all a variety of topics, answer questions, get a better idea of where, where they're at. So by that point, I have a pretty good idea of, of where where they're at because I've you know they they filled the client application form I've interacted with them for an hour to an hour and a half um, you know discussing their goals and where they're at and so you know I give them an initial plan and then from there you know as far as assessing things and making adjustments um, we'll have clients a lot of times if they have questions on form especially on some of the bigger you know bigger more compound lists shoot videos of themselves doing the movement so that I can give them feedback. Um, we have, you know, I have clients set pictures, um, same time of day, same lighting, um, to try to, you know, basically account for any variability. Um, and then they, they shoot body weights and measurements and stuff too. So they, you know, I have no, they, they are keeping in touch with me if they're not dieting for a show at least once a week, if they're dieting for a show at least two or three times a week. Um, so there, there's a lot of back and forth throughout the week. Um, the, the clients that have the most success are the ones that are always in contact with me that I'm talking to two or three times a week um, so, so that we can keep on top of things and we can make sure they're staying on track. You said uh, you worked with your wife and uh, I was just wondering how you delegate different jobs? Like is one person like has a better specialization in one in one aspect of, of a program and one another or different clientele, different demographics. Yeah, so my my wife has a bachelor's in ex-biz and she's got a master's in clinical ex-biz and she's got the I don't know if you're you guys are familiar with the RCEP certification through ACSM, but she's she's a registered clinical exercise physiologist. Um, and it's a, from what I gather it's pretty hard cert to get because you need to a lot of hours of actual clinical exercise experience to even take the exam. Uh, but so she's worked in cardiac rehab for like five years now. Um, and so, but she has a back, and she competes in figure contests too. And so we, we both kind of have a background in the exercise nutrition area. And as far as the dividing tasks, you know, she has a full time job. I'm finishing up at school, but this is my full time job. So a lot, I would say more of it falls on me. Um, I would say that you know I work with pretty much all the competitors. Um, she'll work with some of the non-competitors. She does, she is better at working with 
non-competitors given the general population that I am. Um, probably be because that's what she works at, you know, with on a regular basis. Um, when I started doing this, I was, you know, working with just a few of my friends who were just as motivated as me. So I assumed everybody was as motivated as me. And once I started getting some people referring to me who were just general population, it was like a rude awakening. Um, and I had to learn how to kind of tailor it to them. But she, yes, she's better. With, so she works with some of the general population. She, when it comes to shows and, and posing and stuff, she does a lot more with the women. Uh, when it comes to hair, makeup, um, shoes, you know, posing suits, all of that stuff. Um, when we do Skype posing sessions, um, she does the, she does Skype posing with pretty much all our figure bikini clients. Um, I work with the bodybuilders and physique guys. Um, so, she, you know, and she and she does a lot of the, the paperwork, bookwork side of things too, um, which which is nice because it takes some of that off of me. Um, so yeah, we kind of we kind of have things divided. I would say that most of the client interaction is is me, but not all. A lot a lot of the general population, especially some of the women in the general population, do a lot better with her. Um, and then a lot of the female clients are also working with her in a lot of aspects of prep as well. Um, so that that's kind of how things are divided. Matt, you have a question? Yeah, um, I looked at your website and I saw like a lot of bodybuilders. Like, do your clients? Use steroids, or is that like you only use only talk to clients who are natural? Yeah, so I, you know, I guess my first, I, I'm a natural bodybuilder. I've never taken steroids. I take drug tests every contest they go to. Um, I, you know, I don't care if people do. It's, you know, my opinion is it's whatever. It's your body, your choice. Um, that's that are tested. Um, you know, as long as you're not so much using and competing in a drug tested contest, um, that's pretty low. But I mean, as long as you're not doing that, um, I'm cool with it if you want to use and compete in an untested contest. But when it comes to clients, I've worked with a few guys who have used, and I haven't had very good success because one, I don't know anything about it, two, I I'm not legally going to give any advice on it because I'm not a doctor and I don't want to get into that. Um, and three, it seemed like when they would go on and off of things, it would affect their progress a lot more than any um, any adjustments to nutrition or training I'd be making. I, did, I mean, I'm just, I'm sure if, if I used and I knew more about it, I could figure some of that out, but I, I honestly, I'm, I'm not, I, lately if people are, not natural. I a lot of times turn them away now that I've kind of expanded and have a larger client base and, and I, I can be a little bit more picky about who I work with. Um, and so I, you know, everybody on our website is natural. Everybody on our website, all those pictures from contests that drug test. Um, so that's kind of the direction I've gone. Um, I'm not opposed to working with people that use. I just, I feel like there's probably other guys who the coach guys out there who know a lot more than I do about that. I just, I, I simply don't have the experience. I, I, I have no interest in using myself and never have. And so, um, yeah, I, I, for the most part, I work with people who are natural. Um, I would, at this point, almost exclusively. Okay. I read an article on your website about bodybuilding science versus bro science. And can you talk a little bit about that and why they train to failure and why you should yeah, um, you know, I would say that, you know, they, there's a lot of things that would be considered pro science and body. So yeah, that article was more so written because I see a lot of debates on Facebook and people arguing about things that, you know, may or may not matter um, and arguing, you know, science versus, you know, not science. And so I want to point out, like, what are the main things that most people, you know, most people who are successful in the sport do, um, and and you know maybe it's a little bit different here and there, but you know most people in the sport, you know, have a little bit have a higher protein intake. Now, what that is, you know, greatly differs. Most people in the sport, you know, uh, you know, consistently train with weights and get stronger for a long period of time. They work on lifting heavy weight. Uh, they usually have to incorporate some sort of form of cardio. They usually have to. Um, you know, usually they get lean before they do a 
Peak and Plan. Usually they, you know, learn how to pose. And there's a few others in there, but you know, more so. Yeah, that was kind of the point of that article. But yeah, there are a lot of things that you know aren't necessarily science based that people do. And you know, I'm someone who kind of straddles both sides of the sport. Um, you know, I'm I'm in the trenches doing it myself, and I have the science education background. And so just because something's not backed by science, I wouldn't say it's garbage. Um, if science shows the exact opposite, I probably wouldn't do it. Um, but you know, some things, there are a lot of things that the bodybuilding world, um, people in the bodybuilding world do them, and then science later catches up. Like the idea of increasing protein intake, that, or, or even more recently, increasing protein intake even higher while dieting. Um, things like, uh, things that still need to be kind of explored a little more, you know, our repeat days. Um, I just wrote an article that should be up on BibleLane.com fairly soon on, on the science of repeating. Um, you know, uh, the, you also see things like, um, you, know, you know, some of the metabolic adaptation stuff um, needs to be studied further. So there are things that you see in practice that science hasn't caught up to yet. So I, I think you need to, I, but I wouldn't, use it as a be all end all like if science hasn't studied something yet you're not going to do it um, you know obviously yeah like I said if if science says this supplement doesn't work well then don't waste your money on that supplement I mean that's just foolish but there there are things out there that need to be studied further we don't have the answer for everything yet um, so that, that I don't know that, that probably didn't completely answer your question but um, did, did I so that yeah a little bit Go ahead, Laura. Um, what's like a typical day for you? A typical day for me? Um, so right now, I would say a typical day for me, I still get up at like 6 a.m. each morning. Um, I, I get up, I eat some, and I get started with emails. I sit down on my computer and start knocking out emails. Um, and so I knock out the emails that have shown up since I went to bed, um, and I can usually knock those out by eight or nine in the morning. And then I go to the gym, because um, the beauty of making my own schedule is I can go to the gym at times when most people are at work. Um, and you know, and so I get to the gym eight, nine in the morning, work, get my own workout in in the morning, I go home, eat, shower, I'm working again by 11 noon. Um, and then depending on the day, and you know, what I have going on, um, you know, some days I still have to go to campus in the afternoon and, and do some writing or have some meetings or, you know, meet with people. Um, so I, you know, I, I go to campus for the afternoon. Um, some days I have a bunch of client plans to write or I'm working on an article or I'm working on a talk. And that's the kind of stuff I work on during the afternoon. Um, you know, and, and some nights, some nights I'll have client Skypes and, and things and phone calls. You know, it's, it's it's just like when you train people in person, you have to work around their work schedule. So a lot of times it's nights and, and weekends. So a lot of my clients guys for posing and, and new clients and things are at night or on the weekends. Um, and so it's, it's pretty flexible as to you know my actual schedule. Um, but it, it is seven days a week. I do answer um, multiple times a day usually. Uh, and so I can, I do have the flexibility, which is nice to kind of move around when I'm writing programs for people, when I'm Skyping, you know, with people for, for posing and new clients and things like that. So I can kind of make that work. So for example, this weekend, I, I've been out of town the last couple weekends, been doing a lot of traveling. And so um, I, I need to catch up on some Skype posing with quite a few clients and nights and weekends generally work best for most of them. And so, Saturday, I basically just, you know, blocked off staff, basically all of Saturday afternoon and I just have client after client, like four or five in a row, just doing Skype posing sessions for a half hour to an hour. Um, that's my Saturday afternoon, which is all right. I mean, then, you know, I get, I kind of can, you know, I can kind of set my own schedule. Um, you know, yesterday I had a bunch of, I was traveling till Tuesday and yesterday I had a bunch of plans to write, so I spent the whole day working. You know, I probably worked like 10, 12 hours yesterday. Um, you know, and, and got a lot of, got caught up on a lot of stuff. 
you know, that I kind of put off while I was traveling. And um, so, you know, you have flex. I have some flexibility, which is really, really nice. Um, but there still is. I mean, I still respond to client emails every single day, probably multiple times a day. Um, at the, you know, a couple times a day at the very least, um, just because I want to stay on top of things and. You want to, I want to give them the service, the kind of service I would want myself working with someone. Um, and that that's what's gonna get them to tell other people that working with me is good and, and like, I'm an awesome and, and give me more clients. So, uh, how many clients do you work with on an average? How long do they typically stay with you? Um, so right now I'm somewhere between 50 and 55. I have been the last um, for the last few months. So generally, in the body, you know, with bodybuilders, every year you can, you know, looking back, it, April through about September, October are my busiest months. Um, maybe March through October, you know, something like that. Um, November, really, November is through February, March is, is a little slower, and my numbers will go down by 25, you know, 25, 35 percent. Um, in the past, you know, when I first started, I. You know, I, you know, there were sort of like 10 people, you know, 15 people, you know, for, for a while. Um, it, it didn't just like grow overnight. It wasn't like a boom, I'm working with 50 people. Um, you know, so I wasn't working with that many people. And, you know, last, 2014 was really where things kind of expanded. And I got to a point where, so I'm still working on my PhD. And so I kind of had to balance how many clients can I realistically handle you know, and, and work on my PhD. And, you know, I got up to about 35 or so, and I was like, I, I can't handle any more than this. And last year, when we got to kind of the busier area and it started shooting up in like the 30, 35 area, I was like, I can't handle more than this. And so I, I capped it and just made a wait list. Um, you know, I, I lost clients because of that, because they went to work with someone else. Some of those clients still stayed and worked with me when I could, but it was what it was. I had to, you know, regardless, I, at that point, I didn't know what whether it go more traditional route or the route I'm going, but you know, I I knew that you know I needed to finish my degree, and so I had to kind of put a cap on things. This year, fortunately, when things got busier again, um, I have you know I'm close enough to done. I've just been writing. Data collection's done. My, at this point, I've done pretty much in just the revision process. Uh, I got my defense date set, and I'm just shooting my with my advisor doing rounds of revisions and things, um, you know, and, and so I, I can handle more clients and I'm not really capping it at all. Um, most likely even once I graduate and I don't have to deal with, you know, once October or so rolls around and everything's deposited and I'm done, um, I'll probably kind of do some posting and spamming around social media to try to um, get some more clients. I, I can handle more than that if I didn't, you know, with, without having school also. Um, so it's, it's a little bit different when you, so when you're working with someone in person, um, you know, they come to you for an hour a couple times a week, um, you know, and, and the going rate, you know, for that is, in this area of the country, is like 40 to $60 an hour. Um, you know, you come to me and you, pay, you know, equivalent to a few hours of personal training, but you get your entire month of nutrition, workouts, you know, all of that. But I'm not there holding your hand um, and so in the gym. And so, you know, it's got to be someone who's more motivated um, and because they know it, because um, you got to do it yourself. But anyways, as far as handling that many clients, you still, I still want to always stay at the point where I, if someone asks a question that, um, where I, I need to give a few paragraph response, um, I'm able to do that. Uh, I, I don't want to be someone who, like, I want to have the, the initial phone call with them. I want to be doing the Skype posing. I want to be traveling to contests. I want to be, you know, interacting with them multiple times a week and, and in more than just like a two sentence interaction, like actually give them quality interaction um, multiple times a week. And so, um, you know, and so that's always, you know, if you're gonna work with people online, that's something you need to think of too. But as far as how long they work with um, with me, 
I, you know, a lot of our, I guess it's, it depends. Some of our general population people just like want workouts and things and want to stay accountable. And we've had some general population clients who would work with for two or three years now, um, you know, just because they want someone to be accountable to and make workouts for them and stuff. Um, you know, I would say that a lot of our competitors, uh, even some of our competitors we've had for a couple of years now, so they where they've competed, we're doing like off seasons, they're gonna compete again. I would say the majority of people that we work with in the off season are kind of newer to the sport. Um, so there's a lot of people we work with who, you know, it's very common for people to come to to me and say, I want to do a show in three months, and I look at what they're eating, what their training is, what they look like, and tell them how about a year. Um, because it's just not realistic to do it in three months. And so, you know, I get people in that situation. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, and, and what's common for a lot of the people who have been competing for a while, they'll just work with me during prep and then go do their own thing in the off season and then just work with me during prep again. So there's kind of a whole variety. Um, but I, the small, the shortest term package I let clients sign up for is three months uh, because I figure you need, I, I want at least three months because you're not going to get any any less than time than that, really. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be able to help you out a significant amount um, in, in like five weeks or anything. So I, I generally, you know, at least three months, and it kind of depends on the person and their goals. Because um, we kind of got a variety of them. Uh, do you have a question? <clears throat> no, it's my same question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so when it comes to your clients, um, their diet plans and training schedules. Do you implement any type of supplementation for them, whether it be like creatine or thermogenics or just different types of protein you take? Yeah, so I, you know, admittedly I'm not a huge supplement person. Um, you know, most supplements you find legally haven't been shown to work. Um, there are a few that have. Uh, and they're definitely, you know, there are a few that have. You know, they're not going to work like magic. Like, it's not going to be like, you know, going on or off of steroids. Um, you know, a lot of people, you know, you're say like, oh, creatine didn't work for me. I, I didn't gain 10 pounds in two weeks or whatever. You know, they, no, it's not gonna work like a steroid. Right? Um, and so, uh, you know, as far as supplements go, I, I give them a list. It's not a very long list, usually. Um, it's just kind of the basics, things that actually I can show you some science to why you should probably take this. Uh, but I, I always tell them, it's not gonna make or break your progress. There's nothing you have to take. Um, and you know, if your nutrition and training sucks, um, you shouldn't even probably bother with supplements. You're just wasting your money. Um, I think we all I think we all know someone. Um, I, I know I know a guy at my gym who shows up with an entire bag of supplements, um, <laughs> like a gym bag full of supplements to every workout. I mean, I don't even know what the heck that guy's all taking. Like how much money he spends on supplements and lots. And he's a younger guy too. He's a college kid, and. I, I've said to him before, you know, what what's your you know, he's asked me questions and I said to him before, well what are you what are you eating? What what's your nutrition look like? What's your what's your macronutrient intake, caloric intake, you know, and, you, and he has no idea. And I'm like, so you're spending more money than I spend on food in a month probably on supplements, you know, easily more than that a month, and you have no clue what your nutrition is. Like those supplements aren't doing you any good, you know, because you you know, you haven't covered your basics. Your nutrition sucks. You, you know, his his training is is whatever. I mean, there, there's no organization of that either. Um, you know, whatever someone happens to be doing that he jumps in with that day or whatever. Um, and so, you know, yes, I give supplement recommendations, but but I, I the real focus is is nutrition and, and training and consistency and then. You know, once those are in place, yes, there are a few things that, that can help from there. Um, but it's not going to make or be like a take you from first to last place in your contest, or you know, make you from looking awesome to not or anything like that. Um, so that that's kind of my approach to supplements. How much do you charge per client? Um. So I when I first started, uh, my my rates were low. Um, you know, it, I I think I, at one point when I was working with like friends and people I knew, I think I was charging like a hundred bucks for three months or something. So I was like, great, it's some extra money while I'm in college, like whatever. Um, once we got the LLC, bumped things up a little bit. The 
think it might have been. I don't know. It still wasn't much. Like, I think I was charging like 50 bucks a month for six months or you know something, whatever. Um, over time, as I've gotten more clients, you know, I needed to build the client base at first. And so I needed to lowball myself to get people. And with that came people who weren't that serious. The ones, there were a few that were serious. And if those people did well and they referred more people and eventually got to the point where, you know, more of our clients are serious. Um, and I think that's probably the growing pains that anyone's got to go through to build a client base. And so, you know, I lowballed myself. I, you know, and I wrote articles for free. I gave talks, not even asking what I was going to get paid. Sometimes I did, sometimes I didn't, you know, things like that. Um, just to get, you know, try to build a base. And once I built the client base, as we kept going and going, every time I got to the point where I, you know, where, you know, it's like supply and demand. Um, anytime you get to the point where you can't work, you know, you can't take any more clients, like I'd be too busy, I would have to increase my rates um, to keep my client number where I wanted it. And so, you know, over the years it's increased and increased. And at this point, it's between 100 and 150 a month for three to six month package. Um, depending on what you sign up for, what's included. Um, and that's still actually pretty low um, for most people with my credentials. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's kind of sad because you see people charging, like people with that give cookie cutter plans with that know nothing, charging people like two grand for a six month prep. And, you know, maybe I'll get to that point, but it's not going to be a cookie cutter plan. I still want to give the same quality I give now. But it's, I mean, yeah, it's 100 to 150 a month is my current rate. Um, so it's basically equivalent to someone, you know, so like I said, I don't charge as much as what it would cost you in the gym. So in the, you know, if I was working with someone in the gym, three sessions and they'd be paying as much as they pay me a month. But I'm not there for an hour with them. I Skype with them at first. We put a plan together and we're, we're emailing back and forth, but it's not an hour multiple times a week or anything like that. Um, you know, we'll do some Skype posing and things. and. Those are some of the more expensive packages, but um, but yeah. So I, I yeah, it's, it's it's still you know I would say that you know it's still in comparison to people with my background in education, I'm still on the lower end of cost. Um, that might have to start increasing once I graduate um, and do this full time. But at this point, I, I mean I'm, I'm comfortable. Um, so it is what it is. Like I said, I just kind of use supply and demand to dictate that. What drove you to get your PhD in nutrition science? Um, so I, uh, I was enjoying doing nutrition research. And I've always been really interested in bodybuilding. I've been doing it for my first time a little over 11 years ago now. Um, and so I was sick in classes. And I would always, you know, think, well, how can I relate this to, to like what I'm interested in, like lifting weights, bodybuilding, things like that. And, you know, I, I, and so I, I wanted to learn more. I wanted to, you know, learn more. So, you know, my driver, especially at first, was just to get better at my sport. You know, by learning more, being smarter than other people, and, and you know, uh, trying to maximize what I have genetically. And so. Um, so I kind of started there, and then I started taking nutrition classes, I enjoyed it, I was doing research, but even when I finished my master's, I was like, alright, I'm starting to get the hang of this more, I to learn more, and I, you know, I, I wanted to learn more about nutrition, exercise, things like that, um, and so I kind of just kept going. Um, I would say initially, I probably thought I was going to be, you know, do the tenure track position research all of that and you know I would say that I you know probably halfway through my PhD you know or a little more I really got burnt out on, on that on the research side of things and really had some major burnout and um, you know then I was looking at you know industry or, or more just teaching focused universities and I was, I was considering, I was thinking, oh, I'm going to go to a smaller school and you know, do more teaching. So I, I enjoyed teaching. I, I taught during my master's, about some classes during my PhD. Um, so I, you know, I enjoyed teaching. Um, and then, you know, my business just kind of grew, and from there, I just thought, I, you know, at this point, it, it, this is, you know, I enjoy this a lot. And so, um, I, it's really awesome to see people who. Um, I think the part that probably, I mean, I've had clients with grow cards and, and 
and whatnot, the placement pro contest. And that's cool. You know, and I don't get me wrong, that's freaking awesome. But I, I really enjoy seeing a, a client who comes to me with all of these misconceptions about nutrition and exercise and what it takes to prep for a show. And then, then uh, you know, later, you know, you know, months down the road, you know, they're, they're, they realize that, that, that you know they have they're living more of this lifestyle without the extremes and all the the crap that's not necessary and um, and you know what I mean and, and really actually you know what I mean just completely change their approach to things to something that's so much more sustainable uh, that's really cool to see and, and the people that want to learn and, and do learn and um, yeah I, I, that's really cool so I yeah I mean that's that's kind of how I ended up at this route but. Yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, why I got a PhD is just to learn more. Um, I just never felt like I knew enough. I mean, I still don't feel like I know enough. I I, I wrote was writing an article for for Violet, uh, which, like I said, should be up soon on, on repeat days. And the reason that I did was that, um, you know, I was talking to one of my professors. And about like my contest prep and like the case study we published on it. And I was talking about repeat days and high carb days and things like that. And he's like, "Is there any science at all that any of these claims you're making are true?" And I was like, I, "Well, I don't really know." And so I actually, you know, researched it myself and, and wrote a wrote an article, um, you know, for for Lane. So. Um, talked about this in the last class. Um, well, first of all, my class, how many people are familiar with the physique sports? If you didn't just see like one or two hands, half one up. Um, so maybe you can tell the class a little bit about um, the classes, first of all. I went to my first contest in like nine years um, this past May. And the women's side of things has just exploded. I think there were more, it was a, um, it was a national qualifying show, or it was, an, it was NBC Junior Nationals. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I had a client competing myself, and, and there were so many women there. Like, I think there were two girls competing for every one guy, and there was bikini class and fitness figure and physique and all these different classes for women to compete in. So maybe you can tell, talk a little bit about the different classes and, and whatnot, and then I'll give you my second question. All right, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, so originally, you know, way back when, the sport was just bodybuilding, men's and women's bodybuilding. Um, about the late 90s, shortly before I started in the sport in the early 2000s, figure started um, for women. And so figure was a class where it wasn't quite as muscular, it wasn't quite as lean, um, a lot more feminine than, than bodybuilding. And so for a number of years, you had figure, women's bodybuilding, and men's bodybuilding, uh, which is probably what it was like nine years ago when you went to that contest, last contest. Um, and then from there, what, and at least to the, I, I'm not as familiar with the NPC and the, the untested contest, but the, in the natural contest, what, what's kind of happened over the years is there's been kind of a shift where figure kept getting harder and bigger. Um, and so it almost started, and people quit doing women's bodybuilding and figure kind of got harder and bigger. And then they created bikini to kind of, and now bikini looks like what figure used to look like 10 years ago. Um, and it's kind of a softer, not as muscular um, look. And so, and then women's physique is in there too, but in natural shows that isn't as big because um, really untested women's physique looks like natural women's bodybuilding. And so it's just a clustered mess. But basically, if you were to go from most feminine to most jacked and shredded, you would have bikini, figure, 
Westminster to the Women's Body Building. Where the lines are in between are very blurred um, between some of those cutoffs. What, what they're looking for at different shows is very different. Um, you know, and, and it, it's really messy. Um, it can be with judging and things. Um, there, you know, there are people who are like, well, you can kind of go either way depending on the show, what class you could be in. There's people who definitely are one or the other. Um, you know, in natural bodybuilding, I would say that a lot of them, like I said, don't. A lot of the natural shows anymore don't really have much for women's bodybuilding, and women's physique really hasn't gotten big at the natural level because, you know, you you don't have the drugs to make them any bigger, and the figure girls are coming in so big and lean that it's a lot of it just figure and bikini at this point in the natural shows, um, which figure and bikini look like what bodybuilding and figure used to look like. It, it's just different names now. Um, so it's interesting to see that change. In the men's side, you have bodybuilding still, and then you have men's physique. And I think men's physique was initially created by the, was created by the NPC, the untested shows, um, to try to get more naturals to do their shows because natural guys aren't, aren't doing untested shows usually because you, you can't hang with guys that are that big. And so, you know, without drugs. And so they created physique, men's physique, which is what a lot of the that try to attract you know, natural guys, the so smaller, not as lean. They wear board shorts, which they don't judge their legs, which I, I don't really get. Um, it is weird. Um, and then, uh, you know, at the natural level, there is men's physique too. And in natural shows, it's because there's no drugs to make the bodybuilders huge to really separate. There, in a lot of times, the line is blurred as to what's body, what guys should be in bodybuilding or what guys should be in physique. Also, sometimes it's pretty clear that someone you know should be one or the other, but there's some blurring of the lines there too. Um, and so, yeah, so for, I would say in natural shows, most natural shows you go to are going to have bikini and figure for women, and men's physique and men's bodybuilding for men, and maybe they'll have women's bodybuilding or women's physique, but that's not always. Um, so in the last class, you mentioned that you have about an equal split of male to female clients and male to female competitors. Um, do you train them any differently? Uh, no. <laughs> um, so, you know, yes, women women are going to have a slower metabolic rate. They are, in general, that's not always the case. I have some women that have been, been able to eat more going to the shows than some of the guys I've worked with. But, in general, women, you know, they're, yeah, they're not going to be able to handle as much food. Uh, the absolute number that they're moving on, like a deadlift or a squat, isn't going to be as high as a guy, uh, in general. But that doesn't mean they should, you know, you should really take an even different approach. You still should be training heavy, you should be focusing on compound movements, squatting, deadlifting, pull-ups, overhead pressing, anything you would have a guy doing, a, a woman can do too. I think a lot of people make the mistake, um, especially in bikini. A lot, of, a lot of my clients who are bikini competitors, kind of the, the class that the least muscle kind of, um, you know, they aren't quite as lean um, as some of the other women's classes. The women in that, a lot of times they'll work with people who have been just doing like circuity type routines where they never really lift heavy. Um, and it's amazing what happens when they actually start lifting heavy, the kind of shape change you see. Um, and and just the, you know, I, I've had clients say it just feels so empowering to lift heavy female clients. Um, and so um, there's a there's a woman on our website, um, on our website on our Facebook page that competed recently, Chris Schwartzrock, uh, who's actually in her 40s, um, her late 40s. And uh, she came to us a little over about a year and a half ago, and she, um, we kind of had her doing that thing, you know, circuits and, and not heavy, a lot of high reps. And if you look at her picture, she's like, she's lean, but she's like skin and bones. Um, and, you know, when, you know, there, there's a before after, like a back shot. And after a year of training hard and, and eating a lot, I think she, like I said, she's probably close to 15 pounds heavier in the after. But it, you could just, it's just a completely different shape. It looks like a skinny person compared to someone who competes. Um, there's just, it looks so much better. 
Uh, the one, you know, the shape is there when she was lifting harder and, and really throwing down some food. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think women should absolutely train heavy. So one story I kind of told the last class um, is, you know, about a week ago or so, I was at the gym and I was over by the hammer strength equipment and uh, a woman asked me to, is this a woman who's in her 40s, um, who's, who's thin, previously told me all you need is cardio, you don't need to lift heavy, and asked, you know, has always criticized me for lifting heavy. Um, and she, uh, asked me to pick up a 45 pound weight and load it on this piece of hammer, this hammer strength row. Um, the hammer strength chest for it row, the, where the weight loads on the machine at her gym is maybe like six inches off the ground is all the higher you have to lift that plate. Uh, she couldn't lift a 45 pound plate six inches off the ground. Um, I had to load it for her. So this is somebody who's telling you all you need is cardio. And I would say that based upon that, no, that you need more than cardio because if you, Think you're working out and helping yourself, but you can't lift 45 pounds a few inches off the ground when you're in your 40s. What does that mean when you're in your 60s or 70s? You're not gonna be very functional in, in regular life. You're not gonna do anything. Um, so you're gonna be weak and frail and fragile. You're not gonna be able to do stuff. Um, and I mean, I, I would argue that she's headed in that direction already. You can't lift 45 pounds a few inches off the ground. So yeah, you absolutely do need to lift weights as a female. It can help prevent osteoporosis, muscle loss, um, you know, improve quality of life. You, you know, as you age, even if you're not an athlete, it's, it's beneficial. Any questions? Go ahead, Kevin. So as a bodybuilder, um, what is like the ratio, or how much do you focus on little specialized muscles compared to doing like high down movements like? Yeah, um, so, uh, you know, both are important if you're, you know, a bodybuilder. Um, the nice thing is, you know, you know, the nice thing is you, you have flexibility to kind of, as long as you're training a muscle group, you can kind of, there's nothing you have to do. Um, you know, whereas like if you're an Olympic lifter, you need to do cleans or snatches, if you're a power lifter, it's squat, bench, and deadlift. You know, if you're a bodybuilder, you don't have to do any of those things. Um, they're beneficial. Like so, for example, squat, bench, and deadlift are beneficial for bodybuilding. Uh, but if I have someone with a shoulder problem, we'll train dumbbells. Um, you know, and, and we'll make dumbbell pressing the primary movement, or maybe we'll do floor pressing, um, or you know what I mean, something like that. You know, someone with a, someone who's having back issues, we're not going to maybe not squat or deadlift. Maybe we'll do hack squat, leg press, hip thrust, single legged work, um, and so. You know, tra yeah, we train as much as compounded movements as you can, but you can also work around things um, when injuries pop up and, and when you're having issues. And some people, there's just some lifts that just simply don't feel good. Like they just don't progress on, they don't, aren't comfortable with it. And it might look good. Um, it might even look good, but it just doesn't feel good when you're doing it. Um, I, I have a friend who's, who squat falls into that category. And he can squat over three plates for reps. It's not like his squat's weak. I mean, he trains legs hard. It's just, he, every time he trains, you know, he, he always says it just doesn't feel good. Like, there's a little injury pop up and it doesn't feel good, so he can train around that. But I would say for someone who's healthy, the, you know, the folk, you know, a lot of times I'll start someone's program off or my own workouts off with, you know, a compound movement or compound movements and then move into isolation work. Um, so, for example, if someone's doing like a lower body workout, yeah, they'd probably squat and deadlift first and then maybe move on to like lunges or leg press or extensions or curls or you know something like that. Um, you know, and, and so it's kind of a combination of both. Um, I don't know that there's any one size fits all. Um, I wouldn't do all machines or all isolation lifts if I could avoid it. Um, there are times when people have injury issues where it makes it more difficult to avoid that. But, you know, you, you generally get away with as much as Close, you know, a big of compound movement as you can, um, you know. But like I said, there's nothing you have. To, there's no lift you have to do. Um, you don't have to deadlift to be a good bodybuilder. Will it help you be a good bodybuilder? Yes. If you can do it, should you? Yes. But do you have to? No. Um, and so that you know, it's, it's kind of an interesting balance to strike. I, 
I've worked with some older people, I think. Um, you know, our youngest, the youngest client I've ever worked with is was 16 when I started working with her. Um, she was just turned 18 when she competed. She was a bikini client. Um, actually, no, you can't scratch that. I worked with a 15 year old that competed last fall. I totally forgot about him. Um, yeah, 15. Uh, that was kind of young. Um, he didn't really follow a lot of what I had to say. Um, the, the 18 year old did. She was awesome. But I, I've worked with people you know, on that end. Um, I would say most of our clients are somewhere in their 20s to 20s, 30s, even into their 40s. Um, I've worked with people into their 50s. Um, you know, we, we have one of our clients, um, probably one of our best success stories of a general, popula general population client. Um, I, I wish that he would let us use his progress pictures uh, publicly because it's freaking awesome. But he, he, he's, he was in his, I think he's 55 or 56 a couple of years ago when I worked with him. And over like a year, year and a half, I helped him, you know, diet. He dieted and he went from one or from 230 down to 170. Um, looked like a completely different guy. And he's a local guy here in Champaign. And so I, I run into him at the gym every now and then. And he's still around 180 pounds. Like he's kept most of it off. He's like 50 pounds lighter than he was a few years ago. Um, and he's in his mid to late 50s. And he, he squats, he deadlifts, he, you know, um, presses, you know, things like that. Um, and, you know, from time to time, um, you know, we'll, we'll maybe have a, I, I have a one-time Skype service I provide to clients where we sit down and chat for an hour, I get them a plan, and, uh, you know, there's no follow-up or adjustments, so it's, it's cheaper, it's just a one-off, one-time fee. And so every once in a while, he and I will do that because he wants some new workouts and things or new ideas about this or that. But I'm not working with him anymore. He's still keeping the weight off. So I, yeah, I work with, I work with his wife too. I, later on, and I mean, she lost about 30 pounds while we were working together. So I mean, um, yeah, I work with people into their 50s. Um, as far as competitors go, I think the oldest competitor we've ever had step on stage is probably about 48. Um, there are competitors who compete in their 50s though. Um, but yeah, I've had clients for 15 to 48 step on stage, um, and even at shows, you see people competing into their 50s. Um, and I work with people into their upper 50s who are just general population. How much uh, cardio do you prescribe compared to the resistance training? So the resistance training is always the focus. Um, you know, you're a bodybuilder. The goal is to hold on to muscle, to build muscle, to hold on to muscle. Cardio, my general rule of with, with competitors is um, to do as little as possible while making progress. Um, because one, one, it can interfere with, with your strength gains or recovery in the gym. Um, and two, uh, you know, you want to have room to go. So if, you know, you plan to happen during weight loss and you want to have room to make adjustments, whether it's pulling back, we are adding cardio when plateaus happen. And so, you know, when plateau happens, you, you know, if you're doing seven days, an hour a week of cardio, where are you going to go? And so that's where you hear these horror stories of people doing, you know, two hours a day, every day of cardio and just ridiculous stuff. And then their, their weight blows up afterwards when they're, you know, when they're not doing that anymore. That, that's not where you want to be. Um, and so, you know, what, what cardio usually looks like in the off season, um, at the peak of the off season, most people are doing zero to, if they want to do a day or two of short cardio, you know, just for overall health in the off season, you know, maybe we'll leave a little bit in. That's kind of personal preference, but most people aren't doing very much. Um, and like I said, that gives them room to go. So we can, you know, we don't, you know, at first I try not to add a whole lot of cardio. We try to do more through, you know, pulling back food during dieting. And then if we got to add some more cardio and we do, um, usually I add in high intensity intervals first and then steady state when they can't recover from, you know, doing more hit. Um, but, yeah, I mean, during prep, I've had clients who have only needed maybe two or three short hit sessions a week, like 15 minutes. Um, some those people are genetically gifted in the metabolism department, um, and others who have needed, you know, 45 minutes six days a week. Um, you know, and so I, I think it depends on the person. And you know, even that person that was doing, you know, even those people that have to do 
six days a week, about a half hour, 45 minutes, whatever it ends up being during the worst of their prep. That's not what their entire prep is like. Um, that's only that high because we've had to get to that point. Um, we, you know, we try to get away with more, you know, try always try to get with, away with as much food as little cardio as we can, and we've had to get to that point. Um, and, and I think that's one place a lot of people make a mistake is that they just say, okay, I'm dieting now, and they pull back their food drastically and increase their cardio drastically. And then, like I said, it, you lose really, really fast. Because you're losing fast, you lose, you know, you're losing too fast, or you're actually losing more muscle. A higher percentage of what you're losing is muscle, which isn't good. And then you hit a plateau, and you have nowhere to go. Um, and you're, you're, you don't get lean then. Um, so I, you know, that's kind of my approach on cardio. I mean, for someone with general health, I mean, yeah, do a couple, couple, three days of cardio a week, you know, that's, that's great. You know, so some of our general population people do a little bit more, but, you know, not necessarily as much our, our competitors. Where do you see online coaching going, just in, in general? The trend in the industry is everybody and their brother thinks they're an online coach these days. Um, you know, I, you need to, you know, I, I, I would, I would say that, you know, the people, the people who are good, incredible resources are getting people results, training people the right way. I mean, they're going to be in it for the long term. I mean, I don't, I don't see, you know, I don't see that changing. I mean, I, it, the the area is growing if anything because, you know. It used to be that people were just kind of pigeonholed to whatever, you know, this guy at my gym competes, I'm working with him. Um, and now these days, uh, you know, you could go online, find people like myself or, or someone else out there who has, you know, a decade of experience and who has prep people that are successful and who is educated. Um, and, and you can work with someone like that. And I think those are the people that are gonna make it long term. Um, you know, and I think those are the people that really stand out when it comes to, you know, people who do this. Um, I would say that, you know, the people who, you know, go about it by doing one contest, placing decently well and getting a big Instagram following, um, aren't going to last long term because they, they don't know enough. You know what I mean? They, they, you, they're not going to be able to stay relevant, you know, their, their whole being of being able to do this and get clients is through just being popular. Um, not necessarily, you know, their ability to coach people, what they know, anything like that. And so I see, you know, those people pop up all the time. Um, there's a there's a girl at my gym who is dieting for her first show, apparently. Uh, she's talked to me a few times and she, she doesn't like anything I have to say, so she, she's never, you know, you know, worked with me. And she even approached my wife, my wife basically told her the same thing I did. She didn't like to hear any of that. So um, she's working with someone who did a show that wasn't sanctioned by any, it wasn't sanctioned, it was just some show at a university somewhere, like a college show, like, you know, at a university, unsanctioned. Um, it was a small show. She placed somewhere in the middle. Um, she's younger. She, that was her only time she ever competed. She has no education in this. And this girl, you know, who she worked, this girl, you know, who, who she's, I guess, kind of working with, gave one of her friends a plan, and that friend is giving, is, she's using her friend's plan. Probably not going to get very far. Um, and, and, you know, someone like that isn't going to last very long. It, the people that are going to last, you know, are, are going to be the people that stand out. And so, you know, if this is an area you want to get into, you need to stand out in some way. You know, what something's got to make you different um, to kind of get in, you know, get, to get you a client base. And so, you know, in my case, what makes me different? I can have a PhD in two months and I have a pro card. There's, what, you know, half a dozen people in the country that have that? That makes me different. Um, that doesn't mean that I, I have, I'm the best coach ever, I have a bunch of clients. I mean, that just usually gets me clients. Um, the, what's grown my business and kind of, you know, built everything is the fact that a lot of my clients have done well and have positive things to say about how they've been treated and the results they've gotten. Um, and, and so that's where like, you know, I have a client testimonials page on my website. You can see some of their testimonials on there, which are, which are awesome. Um, you know, there, there are people that did really well and, and really appreciated help. And, and you know, that's what's going to bring you more clients is, 
you know, yeah, my education, pro card, great, and that's what gets me in the door, but what keeps me, you know, getting more clients is, is my clients being happy and getting good results and treating people the right way. Um, you know, giving, you know, when someone asks a question, giving them if that response takes a three, four paragraph response and maybe some links to articles and or videos or whatever, um, doing that rather than giving them a two sentence response. Um, you know, that, that, you know, that's kind of where I see things going. It's, it's probably still expanding. And I, I think that, you know, people are gonna come and go much like in the support of bodybuilding and, and you know, there'll be characteristics that everybody who, who uh, sticks around for a long period of time kind of shares. Any other questions for Peter? All right, we're uh, running out of time, so if you want to just give them a quick piece of advice, send off, just in general, some, some yeah. students in the class yeah. who are going to fitness, some want to go into physical therapy, others want to go into more detailed medicine. Yeah, so I guess my, my biggest piece of advice would be work hard, and do it for it consistently for a long enough period of time. And I think if, if you work hard at something for a long enough period of time, um, you're going to get somewhere. So I I can see that looking back, you know, there are days I wake up now and I'm like, man, I can't believe I'm, I'm at where I'm at now. Like, I'm, I'm actually in a decent spot. I'm not a poor college student anymore. I'm, heck, I'm, I'll be 30 next spring. I mean, like, you know, like, um, like I look back to it, I'm like, you know, it, it was a lot of hard work, and I've done it for a long period of time to get me here. Um, you know, I, you know, when it comes to school, I mean, I went to school for, it's going to be 11 and a half years, uh, you know, three degrees, bachelor's, master's, PhD. Um, you know, that, I, that was a lot of work, and it was, I, you know, and it didn't happen overnight. Um, when I won my pro card, uh, I had been lifting for 10 years. That was the fourth time I dieted it down and did shows. Um, you know, it, it, it didn't happen overnight. Um, you know, and, and that's pretty common with most people in the sport of bodybuilding for it to take a decade or, or longer. I mean, it takes a long period of time, especially as a natural. Um, with, with my business, I mean, I started out working with just a few people I knew and I, I worked you know, worked hard, treated them the right way, and they talked to more people, and, and you know, we, we slowly built up from there. Um, again, didn't happen overnight. It was a lot of work, and it continues to be a lot of work, but, you know, and, and I'm sure I'll look back in a couple of years from where I am now, and, and hopefully, you know, things will be even in a better spot. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, regardless of what you're doing or what your goals are, um, generally, if you you know, generally it's not going to happen overnight, and if you work hard for a long period of time, um, you know, you're, you're going to get there. Great. Thanks. Yeah. All right. All right. Thanks, Peter. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. 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 Thanks,